Good evening. Welcome to tonight's webinar, The People Must Know Before They Can Act, Voting, Citizenship, and Civic Engagement. This is the second installment in our three-part series on the history and contemporary issues around voting rights, which we're calling Connecting Past and Present in Matters of Voting. I'm Dan Osborne, a Program Director at Primary Source, and it's my pleasure to be joined by all of you tonight particularly as we're on the cusp of a national election in which so much of what we'll discuss tonight is relevant. When we last met, we were joined by Professor Alex Kazar, who among the many insights he shared, uh, offered us connections between the perpetuation of the Electoral College and white supremacy and white nationalism throughout US history. It is this connection between voting, race, power and disenfranchisement that we'll continue to explore tonight. We'll ask questions about the voting process and the cultures and structures that have interfered with people's full participation in the franchise. This will entail hearing stories of activism and civic agency. It will allow for us to think critically about how political change happens and the sorts of power people vie for and demonstrate through their use of the ballot, but also by other means. I'm truly honored to be joined by Professor Amina Pilgrim tonight. Dr. Pilgrim is an assistant professor of Africana Studies at UMass Boston. Among Dr. Pilgrim's areas of expertise are African diaspora studies, critical education studies, hip hop and youth empowerment, and women, gender, and identity studies. Dr. Pilgrim is also an oral history practitioner, community organizer, and the founder of the Hip Hop Initiative at UMass Boston, which uses hip hop to increase critical media literacy among greater Boston youth. Before we begin, I would like to remind everybody that, you, that you'll start this webinar muted, but you can use the question feature in your control panel to type a question. We'll collect these questions and pose them to Dr. Pilgrim at the end of the presentation. So thank you for joining us tonight, Dr. Pilgrim, and it's our pleasure to have you here to share your expertise, particularly as we count down the days to an election that is so very much influenced by much of what it is that you'll share with us tonight. Thank you again. Thank you, Dan, and thank you, Primary Source, um, including all of the organizers of this event, and a special thank you to our guests who have joined us um, for this virtual session. Um, I'm so grateful to be here and I'm definitely thinking about the gravity of the moment that we're all in, um, this historical moment on the eve of um, an historic election. So tonight's uh, conversation will uh, definitely frame that moment and help us all to understand um, the historical significance of what we're witnessing. So tonight's session, as you can see, and as Dan has mentioned, is entitled, The People Must Know Before They Can Act. And I just want to let you know that that is part of a quote by Ida B. Wells. Uh, some have called her America's first investigative journalist. Uh, she was a co-founder of the NAACP, a fierce anti-lynching activist, and a suffragette. As you know, we, we've been celebrating the centennial of women's suffrage, and that could not have happened without the work of Ida B. Wells. Um, but that quote spoke to the power of public education through media. And I thought that it was apropos because the phrase also connects well with some of our objectives for this series, including particularly empowering informed action and developing empathy. So I'm excited um, to be here with you and to be able to explore um, this topic in this way, connecting voting, citizenship, and civic engagement. Since you can't see me right now, uh, this is a picture of me, uh, your presenter. And as Dan mentioned, I'm on the faculty at UMass Boston. I'm also affiliated with Berkeley College of Music 
and Bridgewater State University, um, as well as Stonehill College. And uh, just so you all know, I'm trained as a historian. Um, I received my PhD in history from Rutgers University in 2008. So um, history is my primary lens, although I am a transdisciplinary scholar. So a little bit about the frameworks that will shape the information I share in this presentation tonight. First, critical education and pedagogy. Um, this talk will hone in on the expansion of and the contraction of voter rights for African Americans and other people of color. So the critical education perspective the critical pedagogy, pedagogy perspective, excuse me, um, will certainly allow us to do that by questioning our existing education system from within and by centering those um, often marginalized voices, the same voices that are often represented by our students in K-12 and also college or community college um, classrooms. The importance of critical education perspective also speaks to the importance of choosing curricula and also shaping our classroom spaces in particular ways, and that includes our virtual classroom spaces. One quote that I often think of um, that hits home the importance of this is a quote by uh, Professor Christopher Emden, who said, we integrated the schools but we forgot to integrate our texts. So in this talk, um, I'll talk about um, our classroom practices here and there to make those connections for any educators who might be watching. The second framework is a decolonial perspective. And the decolonial perspective helps us consider um, differences in ideas, social practices, histories, identities, etc., as you can read there on the screen. And it's really about the production of knowledge. So how can we engage um, students and folks in the community in the production of knowledge and also live that ourselves? Third is an intersectional approach. And this comes from the work of Kimberly Crenshaw. And the way that I use intersectionality is by thinking about um, the various identities of our students. And one of the best examples of that is through the use of various languages. Um, an example that many of us can relate to in the state of Massachusetts um, is the presence of immigrants of African descent my own family uh, among them, because many of immigrants of African descent are identified or classified as black. However, their varied languages um, express other identities that they might hold and they may not identify with those racialized terms, even though we think of them in that way in the United States. Last, an applied approach, um, ask us to think about why we teach. And so for this evening, I want you to hold that question in the back of your mind. Um, why teach this? How do we teach this? And what importance it might serve? Here is what you can expect from tonight's session. And I've organized our discussion into five sections, which you can see there on the screen. So we'll begin with the topic of citizenship. And the top right image shows Dred Scott. Um, Dred Scott is a seminal um, figure in the history of United States citizenship. The Library of Congress um, legal history um, page online, their law library, page defines uh, citizenship and frames the history of citizenship in this way. And you can read along with me on the screen, but I'll simply uh, summarize. 
it mentions the, the Dred Scott decision in which Chief Justice Roger Taney of the Supreme Court um, ruled that African Americans were not citizens of the United States. And the significance of that particular decision was not only that Blacks were denied citizenship, but it was also a determination of what that meant. And it meant that they had no rights in the court and certainly uh, no right to vote at that particular time. After the conclusion of the Civil War, it mentions that um, steps were taken to try to further define citizenship. And finally, it lets us know that the first clause of the first section of the 14th Amendment dictated that all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens. And so it's important to begin um, with framing our discussion of voting with citizenship and connect it to the purpose of public education, which in part is intended to prepare and inform citizenry. So how do we do that? And how do we center the story of voting in that task? So one of the most important topics that we all um, have heard a lot about in recent months leading up to this current election is um, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And we'll discuss some of the ways that that Voting Rights Act has been um, stripped of its power um, as we go through the presentation this evening. But it's important for us to talk about how we got to the Voting Rights Act. And on the screen, you will see some familiar faces. Um, Rosa Parks on the day of her arrest. Martin Luther King on the day, uh, one of the times that he was arrested. Um, the civil rights activist, World War II veteran, Medgar Evers, who's on the top center and his widow and son um, on the, after his assassination. And on the bottom, you see a children's book, Lift As You Climb, the story of Ella Baker. And what I wanna pause to mention here is that um, there are many children's books, wonderful children's books that have come out recently, including this one, including the graphic novel, um, The March by, um, John Lewis and others um, that teachers can can use um, to really bring a multicultural perspective to the topic of the struggle for voting right. And each of the people that's fe featured in the images that you see on the screen um, played a central role. And many times uh, we're not taught those details in mainstream history, but I think it's really important um, to foster engagement by allowing students to see the folks that look like them and to get uh, to dig deep into those stories to understand, you know, how particular laws uh, came to be. And so next I'll just um, briefly go through some of the major events in the timeline that led up to the 1965 Voting Rights Act. I think it's important to think about the fact that um, citizenship and voting were originally tied to um, white property holding males, as you probably know. Um, and post-Civil War, um, we know that through Jim Crow laws um, and through racialized um, terror, domestic terror, um, African Americans were denied uh, the right to vote and or intimidated from voting. However, in 1944, as you can see there on the screen, um, through the Smith versus Allwright decision, um, one of those patterns known as the white primary, which excluded blacks from voting was deemed unconstitutional. 
other events happened during this timeline that related to popular culture, um, sports, all of this helping us understand the era that led up to the 1965 um, Voting Rights Act. For example, in 1947, Jackie Robinson broke the color line, joining uh, Major League Baseball team, the Brooklyn Dodgers. And so um, this was a victory for people of African descent who were very proud of Jackie Robinson and other figures like him who made popular success. And this is one of the ways that we see a pattern of African Americans makes, making certain advances in society or in popular culture in various realms. But then on the other hand, um, decisions being made that demonstrate systemic racism and oppression, and many times um, this being tied to voting and to cutbacks in their citizenship rights. So an example of that was the 1948 Shelley versus Kramer um, decision. This was another attempt um, to protect the rights of African Americans and to urge them or um, edge them forward in their advancement. Um, and in 1948, again, President Truman signed into action Executive Order 9981, which prohibited discrimination in the armed forces. Perhaps the most famous um, case of all in this era was that of Brown versus Board. Um, so this was a victory for African Americans led by Thurgood Marshall, um, the NAACP. And as you all know, um, this case struck down school segregation. Um, but then another setback with the lynching of Emmett Till in 1955. And the reason why I'm going through this history is because there are so many parallels um, with um, the moment that we're in right now. And the Emmett Till case is one that brings to mind um, some parallels in this struggle for voting rights and for um, full citizenship. Emmett Till uh, was lynched at 14 years old, but his mother made a historic decision to let the world see her son. And this is reminiscent of so much social media um, that we have seen in 2020, particularly um, with the murder of George Floyd and others, which have um, spawned uprisings. And just as George Floyd um, launched many uprisings in the summer of 2020, the lynching of Emmett Till um, was one uh, catalyst that sparked the activism of folks like uh, Rosa Parks, um, who had her historic action in December of 1955. Just to go on, you can see here um, the series of back and forth um, civil rights victories um, and attempts to stem those victories um, that were happening throughout the early 60s. Um, one of the most ex inspiring examples is that of Fannie Lou Hamer, and I'll talk about her story in a moment. I also want to call your attention to the fact that it was during this moment, um, during the early 60s, when um, Martin Luther King Jr. really rose to prominence and achieved some of the hallmark um, moments in his career that we know so well. Um, one of those was um, the writing of his famous letter from Birmingham jail in 1963, which was actually a letter to clergy. But I'll highlight that because I think for teachers, um, that, that particular piece, the letter from Birmingham jail is a great um, a document, a primary source that students can read and really understand um, the debate that was going on at that moment around um, nonviolent protests. And it also hits home 
you know, a lot of points about engagement on the part of ordinary citizens that will help students think about the potential that they themselves have for powerful actions. Um, the other thing that I want to highlight on this page um, are, again, you know, some of the setbacks. Um, President JFK sent his civil rights bill to Congress, uh, which would become the 1964 Civil Rights Act, and not too long after um, was assassinated. Um, not too long before he was assassinated, the tragic um, Alabama church bombing that killed four little girls happened in um, the South. So again, this push and pull, this push and pull. And all of this led up to um, Bloody Sunday. Um, as many of you know, um, one of the leaders of that march, someone who's in the forefront of that march, John Lewis um, passed away this past summer. And he was among the 600 nonviolent um, voting rights activists that had a confrontation with um, law enforcement on that day that became known as Bloody Sunday. But their sacrifices were not in vain. Um, and shortly after that was when President Lyndon Johnson um, passed the Voting Rights Act, which was meant to enforce the 15th Amendment um, and to encourage and promote participatory democracy. So let's look at some of the individual stories that make up that timeline. Um, for students, you know, timelines are not always the most effective, but stories are very effective. And as someone who um, has had the honor of listening to many people's stories through oral history, um, I find that it's a very powerful tool to connect um, learners to their subjects. Um, the pictures that you see here are actually from the era of Boston busing. I'm sure that many of you might re recognize those images. Um, but I chose those images because I think it's important to connect um, this knowledge to the local as well as to the global. Um, so far, we've talked about the struggle for voting rights on a national scale, but we can talk about grassroots activism in the various localities where these stories, um, stories that we're about to hear um, took place. So I mentioned Fannie Lou Hamer, and Fannie Lou Hamer um, is one of the most important um, African American women to emerge from the civil rights struggle, and particularly the vote, the struggle for for voting voting rights. Um, Fannie Lou Hamer was the daughter of sharecroppers and was herself a sharecropper. Um, she lived on the same plantation. It said for most of her life, um, if not all of her life. And she's someone whose story really uh, reflects um, the horrors of voter suppression, but also um, the power of grassroots activism. Um, she began her, her career um, going to a meeting of SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, um, in 1962. But two years before that, in 1960, she experienced forced sterilization in what was known as the Mississippi appendectomy. Um, Fannie Lou Hamer had gone to the hospital to have a routine um, surgery, um, and the doctors performed a hysterectomy without her consent. Um, so I'm sure that holding that experience and being aware of generations of, of oppression, um, you know, she was more than ready to attend the meeting that she attended with SNCC in 1962. And that meeting really launched her, her career as a grassroots activist and as a leader. Um, she was known for her leadership among um, her community and so she began with 
um, volunteering to register to vote herself, prompted by SNCC leaders. And then she decided to try to register others to vote as well. Um, but on one occasion, when a busload of um, potential voters, um, you know, set off to go to the city to register to vote, um, the um, officials got wind of their plan and shut down the office and the bus was um, forced to turn back. Um, on another occasion, shortly after that, she was identified when the bus made a, uh, a stop and she was identified by state troopers and she was apprehended and um, jailed. During that um, arrest, while she was in the jail, she was um, severely beaten. Um, and she was beaten in her words until her body um, was as hard as metal. So more than one man um, was forced to beat Fannie Lou Hamer and she sustained um, various critical injuries that would affect her for the rest of her life. The most important part of that story um, was that she didn't allow that to deter her. Not only did she continue on to register others to vote, she also decided to run for Congress. And so um, we're gonna see a little bit of her story now in a short video clip. On paper. The amendment passes and is ratified. It doesn't mean that black women, yay, we can vote. No, now you're under the same restrictions that black men were under after the reconstruction period. It's an incomplete victory. Native Americans have to wait four more years to even be considered citizens. Chinese immigrants won't achieve full rights until the 1940s. People want to prohibit people from having free and unencumbered access because that means that power and resources will then be redistributed. And then who will that favor? And so there's this fear that's behind all of this. In the segregated South, an organized effort keeps Black citizens from the ballot box. Residency requirements, poll taxes, literacy requirements. The very real threat of violence, of lynching, were visited upon communities who did try to exercise the right to vote, which was why there are vast communities where people didn't even attempt to try to vote. One woman brings the struggle to the national stage. Fannie Lou Hamer was born the last of 20 children to a family of Mississippi sharecroppers. Growing up in the Mississippi Delta, she thinks, well, voting could help change my economic circumstances. And so I am going to try and go and register to vote. She isn't allowed to register. Just for attempting it, she is fired from her job of 18 years and put out of her home. But she persists, becoming a voter and an activist. The bus that she's in gets stopped and all of the people who are with her who are trying to register to vote, they are removed from the bus. Once again, women asking for their democratic rights are thrown in jail. Three white men came to my cell. One of these men was the state highway patrol. He said, we're going to make you wish you were dead. She is physically assaulted to the point that that assault has lifelong effects on her. This time, there is no public outcry. President Johnson pays no attention. But Hamer does not back down. Instead, she launches a campaign for the U.S. Senate. Though the longest of long shots in a district where only 5% of African Americans are registered to vote, she uses the platform to raise her voice. We are sick and tired of being sick and tired. In 1964, Hamer speaks at the National Democratic Party convention in Atlantic City. We want to register to become first class citizens. And if the freedom she told the story of what was happening to Black people in their quest for their natural born right to, to vote. It's just a miracle that 
the land of the free and the home of the brave. Yeah, we have to speak with our telephones off of the hook because our lives be threatened daily because we want to live as decent human beings in America. She used her platform to tell a story that I don't think many people in the nation knew. She recognized that if the South was going to change, it was going to change at the hands of people like her. One year later, Congress passes a law to enforce the 19th and 15th Amendments, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. As much as we want the story of voting rights, not just for women, but for everyone in the United States to be a forward trajectory, there are always new barriers that people find ways to put up. So as you can see um, from that clip, the uh, commentator mentioned the very same kind of push and pull, um, advancement and contraction that the Voter, Rep Voter Rights Act story um, represents and Fannie Lou Hamer's grassroots activism um, hopefully is an inspiring example of um, one group's attempts and one leader's um, attempt at trying to mobilize and not being defeated um, by those um, oftentimes violent actions to suppress um, the vote. And Fannie Lou Hamer went on to create the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. And the next story that I'm going to share with you it relates in many ways to the Fannie Lou Hamer story, um, but it happens 10 years after the VRA uh, was passed in 1965. It's the story of Modesto Rodriguez, a 33-year-old farmer from Pearsall, Texas. And uh, Mr. Rodriguez was uh, someone whose farm grew watermelon, um, peanuts, wheat, as well as corn and he was a pretty successful farmer. He was also uh, the local chairman of the uh, United People's Party, or in Spanish, um, La Raza Unida Party. Um, so Mr. Rodriguez was invited um, and, and tapped to travel uh, a, over 1,650 miles from Texas to Washington, D.C. to testify before Congress um, during the moment when um, there was a demand to amend the Voting Rights Act and to expand it during that time. It's important to note that Barbara Jordan, uh, the first Black woman Congress, uh, in Congress elected from the South, uh, was a supporter of um, this idea and spoke on, be, on behalf of um, Mr. Rodriguez at that time. But the parallels here are that just as uh, Fannie Lou Hamer spoke and shared her testimony about what was happening in Mississippi, Mr. Rodriguez testified and spoke about the stories of uh, Chicano farmers in Texas who were also being denied the vote in very similar ways. And his stories helped to successfully um, secure amendments for the Voting Rights Act in 1975, excuse me, to specifically cover Texas and Spanish speaking citizens. Um, his appearance before Congress was arranged by George Corbel, a lawyer for the Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund. And again, um, the way that his actions, um, his protests, and his grassroots activism was orchestrated um, had many parallels with the African American grassroots activism that's seen in the Fannie Lou Hamer case. Um, the next story is about um, members of the Navajo Nation in 1993 in Utah. 
and in particular, um, two individuals, um, Marceline and Sean Stevenson, um, spoke out on behalf of the members of the Navajo Nation to again illustrate what was happening on the ground in a small marginalized community um, where people um, of the Navajo Nation were being denied um, the right to vote. And in this story, what is interesting is that the fact that they lived on an isolated uh, desert homestead on reservation land um, was working against them because they had no address, um, a traditional address that is, uh, they were prevented from registering to vote by election administrators. And this case is significant because there were over 50,000 homes that were unaccounted for um, at the moment that they were um, attempting to register to vote and raising awareness about what was happening to the members of the Navajo Nation in 1993. So with this example, we're, we're moving from um, the post-1965 VRA victory, and we're looking at examples of grassroots activism and voter suppression leading up to the 2013 uh, Shelby decision that would really change things leading up to the present moment. Fortunately for the Stevensons and other members of the Navajo Nation, um, and thanks to grassroots activists leading something called the Rural Utah Project, uh, they were able to maintain some of their rights and to successfully register many families to vote through a partnership um, between local nonprofit activists and Google to use technology and to use Google mapping to create addresses for those who did not have an address and who were being kept from um, registering to vote. For the sake of time, I'll summarize one last story, which represents um, the issue of felony convictions and how these oftentimes result in disfranchisement. Um, in 2016, um, which is again, um, related to the Shelby decision, a few years after the Shelby decision, Lanisha Bratcher of um, Georgia is arrested and threatened with nine years imprisonment for illegally voting um, after it's discovered that she voted even though she was on probation for um, a crime. The crime was assault with a deadly weapon something that she was trying to sort of put out of her um, present. It was something that had happened in the past and she was um, working successfully to overcome. Um, but North Carolina, an old North Carolina Jim Crow law um, made it possible for her to be arrested for, um, for voting. And it demonstrated the way that the states um, were empowered to suppress the vote after the Shelby decision. So that takes us to that um, fourth topic, the decision itself, and takes us to a moment to pause to think about um, the stories that I just shared with you as examples of um, contemporary voter suppression. Unfortunately, um, the types of patterns that Fannie Lou Hamer experienced in the Deep South um, had echoes that reverberated throughout the nation. And as you can see from those stories from 1975 through the 90s, um, there were various communities that were impacted um, by the fact that the VRA um, was not a total victory by any means. So we know that the Shelby decision of 2013, um, in some ways you might say, um, put a nail in that protecting participatory democracy 
um, specifically for people of color. Um, the late Ruth Bader Ginsburg, whose famous um, dissent was one of only four votes against the Shelby decision, um, said, as you can see in this quote here, that throwing out the Voting Rights Act when it had worked and was continuing to work to stop, to stop discriminatory changes, she said it was like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you're not getting wet. Um, and I think that her words really summarize the significance and the power of that moment. And you can see on the screen here on the bottom, uh, the image of many protesters who rose up um, at the moment that that decision was passed because it really went into effect immediately. Within 24 hours, places like Texas were able to reinstate many of the policies and practices that were um, successfully suppressing um, voting among specifically Black and Latinx people. And so um, Shelby, as many people have said, ushered in a new stage of um, upholding age old practices such as the white primaries or universal um, suffrage, but suffrage for specifically for the white population. Unfortunately, the Shelby County decision has paved the way to the moment that we're in now where we see so much division within society. Um, and that's just my opinion, but there are many, many resources that you can look at to help you talk about this um, with students who might not understand how we got here and why um, the VRA was overturned. Um, so the Shelby County decision will help us um, help us empower students to understand, you know, how these policies came into practice and how states are able to have the power that they do um, to either empower citizens to vote or to suppress their vote. So um, moving towards coming to a close so that we can have some um, discussion and I can hopefully um, engage with you based on your questions. I wanna end just by making a few points about how we can connect our teaching practice um, to the issue of social change and to hopefully um, empower others to get involved in civic engagement. Um, again, I mentioned in the very beginning that my approach is an intersectional approach and I often come in contact with students and families who um, cannot vote due to their citizenship status or for whatever other reason, but it's helpful to engage with them in a discussion about the meaning of citizenship and the ways that we as individuals have agency or personal power and can engage in grassroots activism just the same. We can talk to them about examples such as um, the stories that I shared with you this evening, um, but others that are less well known. For example, one of the most powerful things that Fannie Lou Hamer did in addition to registering folks to vote was to encourage them to grow food. And she created Freedom Farms in Mississippi, which was a project that addressed hunger. Um, Martin Luther King Jr. famously said that you didn't have to have a degree um, to serve. You didn't have to be someone who was established or famous to serve. Um, he said all that you needed was a heart full of love and a willingness um, to help others. And I often share those messages um, with students and families who have concerns, especially in moments like we're in right now, where there is so much uncertainty. And for teachers who are teaching remotely, um, as am I, um, there are ways that we can bring this uh, spirit of civic engagement into our teaching even within virtual spaces. Uh, we can talk about the power of the media to circle back to my title. Um, we can talk about the power that 
uh, young people have in their hands, um, even through social media. Um, but whatever means that they choose, it's important to, to hit home the idea through these stories um, that history is not just about um, law cases and sort of um, larger watershed events, but it's about everyday people um, making an effort to engage in um, activities that contribute to social change, activities that contribute to um, loving our country and um, upholding the ideals of our country. And um, at least from my opinion, um, that's my why. That's the reason that teaching, I think, can be transformative and can um, help young people and their families um, feel empowered and get engaged in really meaningful ways. Um, so I'll end here. I hope that this discussion has been helpful. And I know that Dan will share some resources with you um, that I've assembled um, that might complement the information that you heard. Um, we didn't cover everything tonight, but hopefully we hit home some important points. And I thank you again um, for your attention. Thank you so much. We, we truly appreciate all that you had to offer. And we do have a number of questions. So if you don't mind, we could start uh, the Q&A session. And sure. again, uh, questions are being typed into the question box and I'm going to field them on behalf of the participants. So to begin, you, would, you mentioned the power of stories and I would, I'm curious to know what are contemporary examples of individuals who are engaging in civic action, activism, and who are trying to counteract the sorts of contemporary disenfranchisement that you are aware of, that you're following, and who you think epitomize the sort of spirit of those individuals from the 50s, 60s, and beyond that you mentioned throughout your presentation? Well, um, I think there, there were a number, number of individuals and groups um, throughout the country that really uphold the legacy of activists like Finney Lou Hamer, um, leaders, more popular leaders like um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And I'm thinking of um, individuals like Stacey Abrams in Georgia. I'm thinking of um, Reverend Barber who has re resurrected um, the Poor People's Campaign, which is what Dr. King was leading at the time of his death. Uh, his assassination. Um, so these individuals are doing this work on a national scale. Um, and then there are others um, who are doing this um, at the local level. Um, where I live in Brockton, Massachusetts, there are city councilors like uh, Tina Cardozo, um, who's Cape Verdean. There's the founder of the Brockton Workers Alliance, Isabel Lopez. Um, these women um, oftentimes are at the, at the forefront of local grassroots activism. And they're working on multiple issues at the same time, not only encouraging folks who are able to do so to vote, but also uh, connecting people to important resources if they are food insecure or hungry. Um, or if they need some other type of relief during this moment of um, multiple pandemics, but particularly COVID-19 relief. Um, again, these women are at the forefront. And those who are leading on the national scale, um, you know, are, are helping to, to make the fight more visible. Um, but I do think that, you know, the fight has continued. Um, one of my favorite historians is Vincent Harding, who called um, this the river of protest, the river of black protest. 
and the river is continuing to flow. Um, even though we're in scary times, um, those folks that are up upholding these legacies um, give us some hope. So does that answer your question? It does, yeah. Um, we have another question coming in that's, that's related to um, contemporary realities around us, but also connected to your work with students as a teacher. Um, you, you mentioned a number of the contemporary resonances. How do you, as a historian and as an educator, help students make connections between the past and the present without making false equivalencies and while helping them see continuity and change? That's an excellent question. Um, one of the things that I do is try to uh, frame our work in history classes um, with the idea that history you know, exists in both the past and the present. Um, so, so we would look at, you know, particular historical events um, and try to make connections um, between the, the actions that were taking place at a particular moment and the trends um, in that historical moment that sort of shaped, you know, whatever event it, it is. Um, so an example of that is um, examining the arrest of Rosa Parks um, after her historic action. Um, oftentimes when I, uh, working with students to learn more about Rosa Parks, um, it's helpful for them to understand Rosa Parks' present, you know, what, what were the things that were happening around uh, Rosa Parks, around other members of the NAACP that were working with Rosa Parks at that moment. Um, and this is why I connected it to the lynching of Emmett Till. Um, so by, by helping students, you know, make connections between you know, the various moments um, at that particular time, it hopefully hits home to them um, how, you know, particular actions or um, historical watersheds don't happen in isolation, but they're connected um, to present realities. Um, and then fast forwarding it to now, um, I might isolate a particular current event and ask us to, or ask students to explore, you know, what policies and practices led up to that. Um, so I'll do something similar to what I tried to do tonight, you know, walk through um, a timeline, a shorter timeline, but looking at particular things that happened leading up to um, a court case or a particular march or a particular assassination. Um, and just ask students to try to make those connections for themselves. In terms of the issue of um, false, I forget the word that the question used, um, false parallels perhaps, you know, I think it's important to, to always, you know, um, empower students to, to, uh, to read the, the text and to understand um, the differences between the conditions that someone faced um, in the past and the conditions that we're in now. Um, and the particularities usually make it uh, reasonable for students to understand that, you know, even though things may look the same, um, we've made certain strides and we're experiencing you know, um, a different moment. Um, so I hope that helps to answer the question. It does, yeah. We have, we have another question. And some of your concluding comments um, approach this in certain ways, but there's a question about 
your what would your message be to students, individuals who are maybe middle and high school students um, who are younger than the age of 18, who are not yet eligible to vote? Um, what role do you see them playing in the sorts of contemporary civic action um, around voting, voting rights uh, in the wake of the Shelby decision? How can we help them see that civic participation is not an eventuality that they do in their future, but is something that they can tap into in the here and now? That's a great question again. Um, and I'm thinking about, you know, our contemporary realities uh, due to COVID-19, um, thinking about, you know, issues of safety and um, personal wellness for youth. But one of the things that comes to mind is uh, the example of many children who were involved in um, the civil rights protests, particularly in the Montgomery bus boycott um, in Montgomery, Alabama. And these children, you know, did various things, including marching. Um, children cannot obviously um, physically march right now, most likely, um, although some of them might might attend um, various events, you know, socially distanced events with, with parents or guardians. But I think that children still have a voice. And I've seen um, in, the, in the past several months, some powerful examples of young people under the age of 18 uh, using their social media to comment on contemporary problems, um, you know, whether it's climate change or hunger, um, poverty, systemic racism, you know, many times these young people are able to articulate, you know, how they're being affected or how their communities are being affected and to raise awareness um, through their speaking out. Um, an example that comes to mind um, in particular is um, a group of younger um, white students that I saw um, in the New England region um, coming on so social media and speaking out about systemic racism that they uh, were witnessing and hearing among adults in their community and just sort of asking people to to unlearn those biases and to think differently. Um, so I think that, you know, young people can use their voice um, and they can do many other things. I mean, they can contribute to um, food drives, they can continue, they can con contribute to mask drives. Um, there are many things happening right now around mutual aid all over the country in local spaces. Um, where people are coming together, young and old, um, to try to do something to affect change. And, and many times those things are not um, voting, but they're everyday actions that are trying to better people's lives. So that would be my answer to that. Thank you so much. We have, we have a question about um, the, 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 difficult and sometimes brutal realities of voter suppression. And when we talk about the stories of individuals who mobilized to create campaigns to raise awareness about voter suppression and to change that reality, the subtext to that is different forms of voter suppression, which at times have entailed violence and intimidation. And studying that sort of history can elicit emotional responses amongst students. Um, as an educator, how do you go about introducing history that includes violence, intimidation, marginalization in such a way that is constructive and helps students understand the complexities of the past without itself inducing trauma or being counterproductive intellectually and emotionally? Thank you. Um, 
this is something that I've um, learned over time. Um, you know, I've been teaching for a little, about 20 years now, and um, I've seen, you know, many instances where students have definitely struggled um, with the, the darker sides of um, this type of history. And I myself, you know, have had to um, confront the emotions that go along with studying this history. Um, so one of the things that I that I do is um, to be careful to set up um, certain stories with warnings about you know what to what they might expect, um, the kinds of emotions that might come up. And um, to also frame, you know, that that very fact with um, the fact and the truth that there's that there's hope at the end. Um, so, for example, you know, one of the topics that I that I taught um, at the beginning of each. Um, course module on slavery, you know, we talk about the transatlantic slave trade, which some people have called, uh, you know, um, one of the most uh, traumatic events in African American history, which gave birth to the African American population. Um, and so when we deal with that topic, you know, I will introduce it by letting students know what they can expect. Um, that it's going to be shocking, that it's going to be painful. Um, I might give some trigger warnings and I'll let them know that although they might feel anger, feel pain, um, feel other warranted um, emotions, they should hold on to the fact that, um, you know, people survived this event in history and all of the positive things that came out of it. Um, so I'll give them that note sort of of hope right at the beginning to 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 hopefully try to balance out you know the negative emotions that they might feel. Another thing that I do is I really try to be intentional about holding space for them to express those emotions um, because I think that young people are not given that type of space enough. Oftentimes, educators might teach something like this and then just leave it there. Um, or maybe students might ask questions about contemporary events um, and they're not given the space to process or to unpack, you know, what they feel. Um, I'll give you an example. My son um, in his remote learning last spring, um, after the murder of George Floyd, he and a couple of classmates um, brought up uh, overhearing the details of the case uh, over, you know, the course of some days when they brought it up in their Zoom class, um, the teacher just acted like she didn't hear it. And she just went on with her discussion about um, whatever the lesson was for the day. Um, so in that type of a moment, um, you know, it might be a, a knee-jerk reaction to ignore it because it's too difficult to discuss it. But I think holding space for students and letting them know that you hear them, you see them, you acknowledge that it is painful and allowing them to express that um, can go a long way towards transforming uh, those emo emotions into something um, powerful. Um, so I you know, I try to frame, again, I try to frame the discussions. I try to let them know what to expect. I try to give them something positive to counter that. And I try to hold space for them to express themselves. And in their expressing, I try to model empathy. And I try to end by offering some type of a solution, either something practical that they can do um, or something that we can do together or by giving them some other, you know, form of an outlet that they might be able to use to channel their energy. 
Um, and one of the messages that I've often shared is that if we harbor, you know, anger and we become hateful, uh, when we learn about these stories of voter suppression and systemic racism, um, you know, if we do that, we'll end up being, um, you know, we'll end up setting ourselves back, but why not turn the pain into power? Um, and so that's a consistent message that I tried to hit home, but I definitely would encourage people to have those difficult conversations and to just learn to be empathetic in the process and to work through it and you'll have positive, um, powerful results. So I think there's two questions I want to pose at the same time. Um, and they'll be the final questions of the evening. And before I do pose them, I just want to again say thank you so much for all of your insights and for the wealth of information you've, you've shared with us. Um, it's truly been a pleasure to, to hear your sensitivity to students' needs in the classroom experience at the same time that you've illuminated so much of this history that, that remains under told. And the, the questions have to deal with that. Um, so th these are stories that are not uh, often in the forefront of what is presented in a lot of classrooms. In your mind, what does U.S. history become, or what is it when we exclude these these stories and these types of narratives of U.S. history? Um, and then related to that, but from a more pragmatic practitioner perspective, is once we commit to telling these stories and breaking silences, what's a piece of concrete advice you have for the teacher who's thinking, well, what can I do with this knowledge tomorrow? What's that activity or resource that I can deploy so that I can break that silence immediately? Um, so th those the kind of existential question and then the that question about practice and what can I do with this knowledge tomorrow in real time? Well, um, thank you for the questions and thank you for your um, affirmations of um, the event this evening. I really appreciate that, Dan, and um, I appreciate Primary Source and all of the work that you do. Um, so I have to say that first and foremost. Um, and to answer your question um, about what history becomes, um, I'm thinking about uh, the work of a Haitian anthropologist um, named uh, Michel Trouillot. Um, who wrote a very powerful book called Silencing the Past. And in that book, um, Trio, you know, talks about the silences that exist um, when history leaves out or when historians leave out, you know, particular stories. Um, so I think that when, when mainstream history continues to leave out, you know, these types of stories, um, it, for me, it's almost like it's muted um, to think about Trio's words. Um, it simply doesn't have the same type of power um, and it doesn't allow for the same types of connection um, for, for students, particularly students of color, students from marginalized identities. Um, you know, history can become a powerful way of learning about society and a powerful tool for engagement when it's more inclusive, when it's more culturally responsive. I think about the moment that we're in where many educators, including myself, you know, might struggle with engagement, literal engagement in terms of the amount of students who connect on Zoom or maybe who just are not connecting, literally connecting. Um, these are the very stories that will transform our virtual spaces and our Zoom classes. Um, when students see themselves represented in the stories that we tell, you know, they, they come alive and they begin to think about themselves differently. 
Um, and I say that from experience because it was learning African American history that helped transform um, my own life, my own learning, and led to, to my career and to a lot of the um, organizing that I do. Um, so this, you know, teaching history in this way is literally a solution to many of the problems that we're having right now with getting certain um, people among the most vulnerable students engaged and uh, connected in their learning. So that's one thing. Um, and to your second question about, you know, what can, what can educators do now um, is, you know, really just dig in. You know, I, I oftentimes will use a video such as the one that I showed you um, or other videos, there's so many, you know, one of the blessings of the technological age that we're in is we have so many powerful visual tools and um, audio visuals to bring this history to life. Um, but I, I would, I would, you know, look among the resources that, I, that I've shared with you tonight um, for something that connects to whatever lesson that you want to teach. Um, and I would look for something that not only connects to the lesson that you want to teach, but that connects to the students. So using that decolonial or intersectional lens, lens think about the students' identities. What identities do they hold? You know, are they, um, are they Latino immigrants from Brazil? Are they um, Lusophone uh, Africans like Cape Verdeans? Are they Francophone Caribbean immigrants like Haitians? You know, what identities do they hold? Are they working class? You know, are they Jewish? Are they Muslim? Um, again, look at those identities that they hold and then look for threads and through lines that will connect to the lesson. Um, oftentimes teachers might say, oh, I already have so much work. I don't want, this is gonna add more work. Um, but it's really no different than looking for materials for shaping lesson plans that we already do. It's just changing out some of the materials that mainstream um, disciplines provide, uh, changing out those for ones that are more reflective of who we teach. And once you do that, um, whatever you choose, if it's a YouTube video or a song, um, you will see magic um, and you will see students, you know, connecting in powerful ways because students really just want to be seen. Uh, they want to be affirmed. And in this moment of darkness that we're in, you know, we can help to be a light um, if we approach teaching in some of these ways. Um, so I hope that I answered those two questions. And hopefully the resources that are shared um, provide some practical um, tips as well as uh, resources that you can actually use um, in your teaching. And we will share those resources out tomorrow. So that'll be something to look forward to. Um, and I just wanna say one last time, thank you so much, particularly for the way in which you held the tension between the difficulty of what it is we're discussing, but also the, the hope and optimism that can come out of thinking about the way in which people participate in history and see themselves as change agents. And hopefully our students and we as well can, can tap into that within all of us so that in dark times we can as well uh, be sources of light and, and hope for the future. So thank you again and um enjoy the rest of your evening thank you everyone thank you dan thank you primary source and uh, everyone stay safe be well <laughs>